Yes, thank you. We're, here, we're not here to talk about um, automobiles, about um, software. We're not here to talk about, um, let's say, bicycles. These are all important consumer products. We're here to talk about health. You know, people living healthily, and often people surviving. Um, if there is a common good or a public good beyond all others, it's health. Nevertheless, there are other consumer goods that are treated from an antitrust point of view, even from a scientific point of view, much more strictly than, than the medical sector. And we, we could see as far as dominant position, as far as transparency. So it's quite, quite shocking because today um, we're living in a situation where a medical model is a total failure. A total failure when you consider the world's population, when you consider maybe half of Europe's population, and maybe more than half of the US population. It is not producing the drugs we want, because it's producing the drugs that are just market driven to make more and more money or to evergreen, as, as, as Peter has said. It's not producing the drugs we need in the sense of health needs, we have the issue of antibiotic resistance, but there are many, 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 many more illnesses around the world that people need that's not being researched because 90% are just towards those, that segment of the population, the research is going, that segment of the population that could pay these high prices. Then, economically, the industry is failing in itself. It's failing in itself. It's kind of, it's dying from its, its so-called successful model because they can't, no one could pay their prices. No, they've oriented their research in this, this way and not to have, let's say, it's gone beyond the economic model of um, Fordism or the, where there would be a, an agreement where, okay, we're going to make money, but we're going to make a reasonable profit and we're going to benefit a large part of the population, which I say is like the social pact after the Second World War that we had between labor unions and, and workers. They're, okay, we're going to moder moderate a little bit the profits, we're going to supply some... So well, that is not the case of the pharmaceutical industry at all. So, in this case, it's not cost-efficient, it's not health-driven, only a small percentage of their profits, very small percentage, goes to R&D, and of that R&D, a s very small percentage goes to what people really need. And this model, that at least in the European Union, has served most of the European Union countries, at least the Western European European country, and some of the Southern European ones, that while they weren't under economic crisis, well, is now I say the chickens have come home to roost. <laughs> what has happened to many countries in the South of questions of life and death? Well, when you go to Greece and you find that 30 or 40 percent of the population has no health coverage, and even those who do have health coverage have to pay out of the pocket a tremendous amount of money, they say, what's happening? What's happening? So we find a system, and so, so this brings us to the question, will TTIP help to solve these problems about lack of access, the a, a system that is scientifically flawed, scientifically flawed as well, because without transparency, without sharing, without lots of eyes seeing a scientific problem, you can't move forward in science, and that's what's happening today. That's what's happening today. Because of these monopolies, because of the lack of transparency, we're not often getting the critical mass of knowing which medicines are efficient and safe and moving things forward. And this goes totally against the basic premise of the scientific method, for example, put out by Karl Popper. So let's, let's see, can, what can TTIP do? TTIP um, can do, maybe could do a lot of things. Will it create, for example, a transatlantic patent pool to buy out um, high-cost cancer drugs, hepatitis C drugs, so we could bring it out as generics, both in Europe, the United States, all over the world? You think that's going to happen? No, it's not going to happen. Are we going to have a transatlantic innovation prizes, for example, that will say, okay, we need a new combination of AIDS drugs? so we could, that could be affordable, so we don't have to wait 20 years under a monopoly, and we could bring them out as generics from the first day, the new generation. 
And it would be great if the public institutions in Europe and the United States got together, put together a pilot. It would save billions for the public health system that are under tremendous stress. I was just reading now on internet that there's sit-down protests in the hospitals in Barcelona because they're closing whole plants of hospitals in Barcelona because of the budget cutbacks. Can we afford paying the prices we're paying for the med prices? No. Unfortunately, and there are many other good ideas, joint procurement, more generic competition. Unfortunately, from what we've heard, that's not what's on the table of the TTIP negotiations. So what is on the table of the TTIP negotiations? I, I, I said a few of these, those of you who were yesterday, um, well, what's on the table is what was presented here in the U.S. Congress by Pharma, um, some, I think in the Congress or the Senate, I'm not sure, of their expectations of TTIP. And this was confirmed, these expectations of the U.S. pharma industry, in the EU pharma industry, it was confirmed that these, these proposals are being considered on the negotiating table. It was confirmed at a stakeholders meeting a few months ago in Brussels with the negotiators where they were asked by the pharma representatives that rest assured, and they used these words, rest assured that the pharma wish list is very present on the negotiating table. So, so this is clear. So what is the farmer's wish list? The farmer's wish list means, I mean, there are many regulatory issues that they said, for example, to set up a working group on, a, on pharmaceutical medical devices as a platform to discuss implementation issues in the future in the EU and the US. So they're proposing, for example, this to be a living agreement, something where, before, just like we've talked about the regulatory convergence, something they could comment in the future. They would like to have um, a harmonized field on clinical trial transparency, a harmonized idea, obviously restricting it. They would like to have patent term adjustments for patent office delays in the EU, which means longer monopolies added on just because the administrative delays. So, you know, it's kind of like if you're waiting to get something, um, you know, you're waiting a, a number of months to get some kind of permit for a drug, this will be added on to your monopoly. They would like um, the issue of patentability standards to be considered in a harmonized way on both sides of Atlantic. They would like an extension of data exclusivity on biologics in the EU up to 12 years. Despite that in the US, I think, data exclusivity is only four years plus a possible eight years of, of um, market exclusivity. I'm not sure. Uh, that's, that's what it said. To establish a benchmark for limiting the use of trademarks other than to protect public health. So maybe they would accept plain packaging. And then they get into issues that are tremendously controversial for the pharmaceutical industry, which is pricing and reimbursement. In many areas of the European Union today, we are bringing down prices because there's procurement, there's open, uh, open bargaining, there's a little bit more um, for example, in Spain, in the region of Andalusia, we, we, they cannot prescribe, no doctor can prescribe a, a, a mark, a brand name for a medicine. And then there's open procurement for the big hospitals or the regions of Spain, as, at least in Andalusia, which is the largest region of Spain, to have lower priced generic drugs. Well, this is being challenged in Tito. So there, there are many other issues about um, pricing and reimbursement. And as Peter said, they want a coordinated approach to kind of punish the bad countries in the South who, that are trying to apply TRIPS flexibilities to bring down the price of medicines. So why is this happening? This is happening because, for example, in Brussels, Ansela, how many um, public health lobbyists, Leonardo from EFA, how many of us are there working full time? I, I'm not even full time on this issue. Um, in, favor of public health, lower medicine prices before the European Union. How many of you think there are in Brussels, Leo? A handful. Just a handful. How many are working for big pharma? I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it. Large pharmaceutical industries. <laughs> um, why, why um, how many do you think there are? 500. No, there are more, there are more. Directly or indirectly, there's some estimates that go even into the thousands, up to 4,000. But there are literally, I mean, there are, there are at least 100 times more than those that defend public health. And this is a very big problem. So it's not just about transparency, it's a big problem for us as well. Even consumer organizations, 
are pressured by big pharma on their positions. And when we challenge, and we are successful on to, to change big pharma's lobbying efforts, which I think we've done with a tremendous campaign on clinical trial transparency in the European Union, then there's a pushback. And where does the pushback come from? It comes from the pharma industry. It comes from international trade agreements. So TTIP is having a big chill on clinical trial transparency today. So after the European Medical Agency approves new transparency rules, the European Parliament approves new transparency rules which are far beyond what the FDA does here in the US, what happens? The European Commission pressures the European Medical Agency, Medicines Agency, to lower the standards and make these rules less um, transparent. On what? On what basis? On what basis? On the basis of intellectual property. And as Ancela said, sending the European Commission from DG Trade, DG Trade and DG Enterprise, sending letters, and this is under inquiry of your EU Ombudsman, sending letters to the medicines agency saying TRIPS does not allow you to share clinical trial data. Because th with a very broad interpretation of what is commercially confidential. So we see that TTIP, and this is one of the issues obviously on the agenda um, of, of the negotiations, clinical trial transparency. TTIP is already having an effect, like it is in many, many fields before it even starts. So, David? What, yeah, I'll, I'll end right now. I'll end right now. In conclusion, in conclusion, the pharmaceutical issue is one of the main, most lobbied issues in the EU-US free trade um, partnership agreement, whatever you call it. We have to bring it out of the closet. It has to come out there and people have to see, have to see the secrecy of these negotiations is basic as well because nobody in the right mind would want to make rules to make it more difficult to bring down the price of medicines and to make the medicines we want and to make them safer if this was transparently negotiated. It just wouldn't happen. If it was on the table, this wouldn't happen. And the influence of the pharmaceutical industry is only possible with the opaque nature of this politics. And their lobbying methods are permitted. And they're, you know, they're, we say, hasta la sopa. They're in, even in the soup <laughs> that, that the negotiators drink. They're all over the place. And, and I think this has to be made very clear. It's not democratic, and it doesn't represent the public interest. And we're talking about health. We're not talking about used tires for cars. Thank you very much.